Would you take God's Word tonight, please, and open uh, to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. That volume is perfect. Don't change it. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I want you to look down in verse number 1. We begin the new ch- chapter here in our study of 1 Timothy. And I want to talk about family rules for the church. Family rules for the church. Look in chapter 5, verse 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And the young, younger men as brethren, and the elder women as mothers, and the younger uh, as sisters with all purity. There's a pastor in Washington, D.C. His name is Craig Barnes, and he tells this story. He says this, he said, When I was a child, my minister father brought home a 12-year-old boy named Roger whose parents died of a drug overdose. There was no one to care for Roger, so my folks decided that they'd raise him as if he was one of their own sons. And at first, he says, it was quite a difficult quite difficult for Roger to adjust to his new home, an environment free of heroin addict adults. Every day, several times a day, he said, I heard my parents say to Roger, no, no, that's not how we behave in this family. No, no, you don't have to scream or fight or hurt other people to get what you want. No, no, Roger, we expect you to show respect in this family. And in time, he says, Roger began to change. He goes on to write, now, did Roger have to make all those changes in order to become part of the family? No. He was made part of the family simply because of the grace of my father. But he did have to do a lot of hard work because he was in the family. Did he have to do a lot of work? He goes on to say, you bet he did. It was tough for him to change, and he had to work at it. But he was motivated by gratitude for the incredible love he had received. Now, I think that's a great story and a metaphor of what we are in the church of God. You know what? We're all in one big family. Guess what? Our father adopted us into one family. And now that we're all in the family of God, you know what he expects? He expects us to follow the family rules. He's got some family rules for his people. And that's what Paul is going to talk to Timothy about here tonight. Now, if you study scripture, you notice that there are many metaphors that the Bible uses to talk about the church. For example, in 1 Peter 2, 9, The church is called a holy nation, which emphasizes our citizenship, that we're all citizens of heaven. And then in Revelation 5.10, the church is called a kingdom, and that emphasizes the fact that we're all submitted to the king of kings. The church is called a priesthood, which emphasizes the fact that all of us have equal access to God. We're all priests of God when we get saved. The church is also called a temple. A temple, and we are living stones built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ being the cornerstone. And of course, the church is called in 1 Corinthians 12 a body, um, with the head being Christ. We're all members of the one body, Christ being the head. It emphasizes our dependence upon the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is called a flock. The church is called many things, but the metaphor that Paul is using. Here in this chapter, chapter 5, is that of a family. The Bible says that the church is a family. Uh, In Ephesians 2.19, it's called the household of God. And And so just think about that. We are all part of the family of God. And think of some ways in which the church is a family. We all have the same father, God, right? We all are begin our prayers, the family prayers, the same way. How do we begin them? Well, if you've been on Wednesday night study with us, you know our Father, which art in heaven. That's how we start our family prayers. Uh, We all became part of this family because all of us have been adopted by God into this family. And once we enter, we have a close relationship with our Father. God is not a distant Father. He's not absent. Uh, He is a God of love. We all share a common family dinner. You know what it's called? It's called the Lord's Supper. We all gather around the table and we share the Lord's Supper. We even plan to attend the same family reunion. That's the reunion one day we're all going to have in heaven together. And so we all belong to this family, and John marvels at it in 1 John 3. He says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath given unto us that we should be called the children of God. And I would just say that this is the family that takes precedence even over our biological family, um, you know, they, they, you know, the old saying, blood is thicker than water. Well, the spirit is thicker than blood. And we are all in the family of God, and this family takes precedence. Consider the example that Jesus set. Remember when Jesus was teaching in a house in Galilee, 
The Bible says in Mark chapter 3, verse 31, And there came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about, and they said unto him, Behold thy mother and thy brethren without, seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round on them which sat about him, and he said, Behold my mother, behold my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. So Jesus kind of sets the example there. The family of God is so very important. Now, here in these verses, Paul is going to teach us some basic rules for the family. And all of these rules apply. They apply to Timothy, but they also apply to us. Look in verse number 7 where he says, And these things give in charge. That is, command these things so that they may be without reproach or they may be blameless. As a family unit, we are to know these rules and we are to interact with these rules. And basically, these rules teach us to interact with respect and with love. Remember the theme of 1 Timothy is uh, in 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul said, until I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. So this is how we're to behave. Notice what I want you to see tonight are three family rules, all right? You ready for them? Number one, here's the first rule. Respect elderly saints as your own parents. Respect elderly saints as your own parents. Look at verse number one. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. And look at the beginning of verse two. The elder women as mothers. And so here's Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy, here's one rule, one guideline. You respect elderly senior saints. You treat them just like you would your mother and your father. Now, showing respect for one's elders is not simply a cultural convention, beloved. It is the will of God. Even the minister, if he is young, must treat older men with deference and with respect. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy. Did you know, according to Old Testament law, the young man should, it says, is stand before the gray head and honor the face of an older man. Just write down Leviticus 19, verse 32. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, that is, the gray-headed man, and honor the face of the old man, and fear thy God, I am the Lord. In doing this, you'll show reverence to God, respect to the elderly, but also at the same time, what are you doing? You're showing reverence to God. You're fearing God. I noticed while I was over in Korea that there would, there would be this respect that was given. Uh, I don't consider myself an old man, but I guess some over there do consider me an older man because some of the younger ministers would come, and they would bow you know, as a gesture of respect. That's part of the Asian culture, just to be very respectful. And, you know, Westerners, we tend not to be as respectful, or at least uh, we don't show the same respect in the same way. We can give honor. We can give uh, preference to um, elders in other ways. The important thing is the attitude of our heart. I got to be honest with you. I look around in society today, and I don't see a lot of respect for elders. I, I mean, I just, I don't mean to complain, or maybe I'm complaining. But I just don't see a lot of respect that the younger show, show toward the elders. And this is an important issue, I think. I, I remember I was over in London, and a lot of times over in London, I'd use public transportation to get around, riding on the underground. And, and you know, what I noticed is when it was full and elderly people got on, none of the younger people got out, out of their seats and offered their seats. I mean, it's just very rare to see that kind of thing nowadays, when that should just be automatic. You offer your seat to to the elderly. You offer your seat to an elderly woman especially that get on. And I just wouldn't see young people do that, and it really bothers me. I think one practical implication of the principle that we see here is that children should be taught to respect their elders. And I think it's good for them to use proper titles when they address adults. I think it shows respect. I think it shows honor. Again, being polite is a spiritual matter, especially in the family of God. And Paul basically tells Timothy, Timothy, you set the example, you show respect um, to the elderly. Um, now, this does not mean, a qualification here, that uh, older men or older women can do whatever they want. Sometimes Timothy may be called upon to, to use correction uh, to his seniors. You know, we, T Timothy was relatively young. You remember what Paul said to Timothy, let no man despise thy what? Despise thy youth. So we have to assume he was relatively young. 
And um, we also have to assume that some of those that were in the church, maybe teaching things that they should not teach, were older than him. Remember in chapter 1, verse 3, where Paul said to Timothy, you charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And I, and I, we, I think we have to presume that these people were older than Timothy. And so there was a time where Timothy would have to use some spiritual correction for those that were in the church. You know, as pastors, we cannot allow false doctrine to go on, right? We have to be guardians of the truth. We can't allow sin to go on, an unbroken pattern of sin in someone's life to continue to go on because uh, sin in the church spreads like disease in a body. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Just a little bit of sin can spread throughout, and it can have a devastating effect upon the whole body. And, of course, the classic definitive passage on family discipline, or we could say church discipline, is Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, what are you supposed to do? You go and you tell him between you and him. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he doesn't hear you, you, you bring back witnesses. What's the whole goal of that? It's, the goal is restoration. And so there are times in the church when there has to be confrontation, there has to be correction. But Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, when you do this, even for, in the church for elders, when you, eat, when you have to do correction, even when you do this for elders, you need to be careful not to rebuke them. The word rebuke here means sharply rebuke. It's a strong term, and it refers to kind of a violent rebuke, not physical violence, but more a verbal uh, a lashing or violence. And so he says, rebuke not an elder, but notice, entreat him as a father. The word entreat, perikaleo, that is to encourage, to admonish, to appeal. It has the idea of strengthening. So even when there is a need for a rebuke or there's a need for correction, uh, you're, there's a, you need to be careful in the manner in which you do that. And you need to make sure that you treat your uh, older man with respect, just the same way that you would speak to your, your own father. And that's a pretty clear guideline, isn't it? And then he says older women. Older women should be treated like mothers. How do we treat our mothers? They should be loved. They should be listened to. They should be protected. They should be cared for. There's a beautiful example of this that Paul gives in Romans. In Romans 16, verse 13, he, he gives a touching word here. He says at the end of this letter, uh, he greets Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well, Paul wrote. And so there Paul uh, has, you know, uh, uh, or gives an example, I should say, of this, this relationship of loving the elderly uh, women as your own mother. Uh, there's, I, I read of an example of this, the great writer C.S. Lewis, who cared for the mother of his friend. His friend was named Patty Moore, and the two men served in World War I together. And while they were serving in war, C.S. Lewis made a promise to Patty Moore that if, any, either, that if Patty Moore died, C.S. Lewis promised to take care of his mother. And Moore w ended up being killed in World War I, and Lewis held up his end of the agreement and uh, one writer says, by all accounts, Mrs. Moore was a difficult woman to live with, but Lewis treated her like his own mother in his own home for some 30 years. We're a great example of this principle. Paul, so Paul says, look, you treat elderly saints, Timothy, as you would your own mother and father with the same respect and the same care and the same love and sensitivity. Number two, second rule, respect younger saints as your own brothers and sisters. Again, look at verse 1, the last half of verse 1. And the younger men as brethren, and at the second part of verse 2, and the younger as sisters with all purity. It is younger women as sisters. First, younger men. Paul exhorts Timothy, when you talk and treat uh, younger men in the church, make sure you do it not in a, in a proud way. You don't look down to uh, younger men. You treat them as equals. You don't look down on them. You don't talk down to them. You treat them as you are equal. You treat them as your brother. Uh, Philip Ryken has a good word. He writes this, the wisdom of running a household this way is obvious. At the same time, younger men are treating older men with deference. Older men are treating younger men as equals. And thus, dignity and intimacy are both maintained in their 
relationships. He goes on to write this. It's the responsibility of the older Christians to bridge the generation gap to the younger Christians and not the other way around. The proper way to talk to a toddler is to get down on one's hands and knees. Similarly, the way to reach out to teenagers is to enter their world by learning their vocabulary and interests. One of the best ways to help younger Christians become mature is to treat them with a measure of equity. And I think that's a very good word on that. Now, I would add that even though older men might treat younger men as equals, younger men should not think of themselves as equal. It is appropriate for a younger man, I think, to continue to address an older man by his formal title, even if the older man invites him to use his first name. Uh, I know I I probably sound old-fashioned when I say that. I get it. Uh, it, But it irritates me when a younger man comes up to a a senior saint, an elderly man, and just begins using his first name like he's his peer. I just feel like that's inappropriate. You know, the whole time, you know, I lived here at Grace under Pastor Johnson, I wouldn't dream of using his first name. I would always call him Pastor Johnson or Dr. Johnson, or just pastor, that was an endearing term. When I went out and traveled with Bill Shade, Dr. Bill Shade, all over you know, Africa and other places where we taught and preached together, I never, ever said, hey, Bill. I always said Dr. Shade. I always gave him his respect. It always irritated me when a younger minister, a minister younger than me, would come up and just begin using his first name. I think that's inappropriate. I think you should treat your elderly saints with respect. And even when, you know, I have older, I had a uh, 80-year-old professor um, friend who kept saying, you know, call me by my first name. And I said, I'm not going to do it. I don't feel comfortable doing that. I would rather call you Dr. So-and-so. So that's more comfortable for me. I would rather err on the side of respect than to get too familiar and not give enough respect. Now, I just think that that's appropriate. But the issue is not so much the address as it is the attitude. There should be an attitude of respect and humility when younger men talk to older men. And the same is true for younger women addressing elderly women. There should be that measure of respect. And so so Paul says here to younger men, you know, or to Timothy, treat younger men as your peers. But then, um, I got off on a little tangent there, sorry. But then younger women, notice in verse 2b where it says that the younger as sisters with all purity. In the family of God, men should treat younger women with the same affection that they would give their own sister. But then Paul adds a warning here with all purity. There must be nothing inappropriate about the relationship. And here Paul is warning Timothy to make sure not to compromise himself in any way, to be careful in the manner in which he behaves around those that are younger women. Because we're going to see as we study chapter 5 that not all the women in Ephesus were discreet. In fact, if you drop down to verse number 12 of chapter 5, Notice what Paul says here, talking about some of these younger widows that were in the church, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. They weren't walking with the Lord, he says in verse 12 and verse 13, and with all they learned to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. And so here Paul warns Timothy about some of the younger women who allowed Uh, immoral desires to overcome their dedication to Christ. They were idle, which opened them up to temptation. And they were going about from house to house, gossiping, being busy bodies. They were being overcome by all manner of things. And Paul is saying to Timothy, just be careful. Make sure you treat the younger women as sisters with all purity. You don't want to say anything inappropriate. You don't want to do anything inappropriate. You want to go the extra mile and being careful and being respectful in that area of your life. And so it's pretty clear. Respect elderly saints as your own parents. Respect the younger saints as your own brothers and sisters. But here's the third guideline. Respect godly widows as objects of God's special care. Now look down in verse number three. Honor widows that are widows indeed. You know, the surprising thing about this, as you study these family rules, we could say, from Paul to Timothy, is that it says really a little about other family relationships. It says so much about widows. There are only two short verses for fathers and brothers, sisters and mothers, but there are 14 verses here that deal with widows. Think about that, 14 verses. Why is this? Well, this was perhaps because the condition of the church at Ephesus was 
such that they needed instruction on this. They needed to be taught how to take care of widows. Evidently, the church at Ephesus had a lot of them. But, but the, the attention to detail and what Paul writes here, what it does tell us is that God places widows in a very important place in his heart. I think God has a special place for single women, especially widows. But it should be noted here, the Greek word for widow is kara, which refers to a woman without a husband. It doesn't simply refer to a woman whose husband has died, but also any woman that does not have a husband. Now, Kent Hughes comments wisely, I think, in his commentary, he says this, today the application of this passage should be wider because modern American culture has produced a category of women virtually unknown in the first century, Christian women and children who have been abandoned by their spouses and left without family support. Godly single mothers are a new class of widow, and those without family resources are the church's sacred responsibility. And I agree with him on that. I think he's right. This refers to any woman single that has a need. And so this whole section then is then concerned about helping women in need. We're only going to get to verse 8 tonight, but there's more to say about that. We'll, We'll pick that up later on. But did you know in the Old Testament, God is called the protector of widows? His affection for needy women is written in the very law. Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, For the Lord your God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow. God takes a special interest in the plight of women who have lost their husbands. In Psalm 68, verse 5, it describes God as a father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows. In Exodus 22, verses 22 to verse 24, it gives a very strong warning about the treatment of widows. Listen to what it says. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. If you afflict him at all, and if he, cry, if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry, and my anger will be kindled, and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows and your, chil- your children fatherless. Pretty clear, huh? Pretty strong. God does not want any affliction or any mistreatment for widows or orphans. Again, Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed is he who distorts the justice due to an alien, orphan, and a widow. And there are so many more verses, and there are so many illustrations in the Old Testament of God's special care over widows. God fed Ruth during the barley harvest and placed a child on Naomi's lap. He spared the widow of Zarephath in the days of Elijah. He provided an abundance of oil for a widow through the ministry of Elisha. And then you can go on into the New Testament where Jesus shows a special heart of compassion towards widows. He brought an only son back to life for the widow of Nain, the Bible says. He rebuked the scholars who, quote, devour widows' houses. And even on the cross, he made provision for his own mother when he said to John, John, behold your mother. John, take care of Mary. He was careful to make sure that Mary was taken care of. And then you remember in Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 44, where he commended the poor widow who gave out of her poverty. Listen to this. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. And Jesus commends the faith of this one woman. But this passage also gives an insight into the status of widows in first century Jewish culture. They were often poor. They were destitute without any means of earning a living. They faced hardship. Uh, We see this illustrated in different places in the Gospels. Um, normally a group from the synagogue was given charge to go around and check on the widows. If you were in a certain village, it was normally the synagogue and those that were part of it that took the responsibility of taking care of widows. They would make rounds on Friday mornings, collecting goods and money to be distributed to the widows during that day. 
That was part of their responsibility. But we see here that, uh, that they were very vulnerable, very needy, needed so much help. And so God is placing a special emphasis here in the early church on making sure that you take care of those that are needy. Paul gives Timothy and the church guidelines then for taking care of widows. Now, notice what he says again in verse 3, honor widows who are widows indeed. What does he mean when he says a widow indeed? What does that mean? Well, Paul's answer to that would be simple. A widow in need is a widow indeed. You can write that down, all right? Any widow that really has a genuine need. But he does give two qualifications. Here's the first one. Number one, help a widow if she does not have independent means. Look at verse number four. Notice what it says. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. So here's the first thing Paul says, look, if she has children, or, you know, the, the, new, the uh, King James uses the word nephews, but the Greek word is ek ganos, which literally means the children of one's children, or we could say grandchildren. I don't understand why the King James, frankly, translates this nephews, because the Greek word is specifically grandchildren. So, widows who are alone need special care from the church, but there are widows that have family that they can draw on for help. And this is the way it should be. In the Greek world, support was given. If a husband died, a woman entered into the household of her son or her grandson. That was the normal custom of the world back then. And Paul wants to remind the Ephesians that this custom was was good Christianity. This is the way it should be. It's a good way to be godly. Caring for your aged parents, that is part of Christianity, that's the most practical theology of all. That is just basic. Uh, First of all, you owe it to your parents. Support is something that children owe to their parents. After everything parents have done over the years, it's only fair that children then return that and provide for their parents when they have needs. You know, this doesn't necessarily mean that children need to provide for all the care themselves, but it's important that, you know, to plan for the future, which may include, you know, of course, proper medical and life insurance and so on. Um, There's a place for um, professional caregivers and all that. But here's the bottom line, that children should make sure that their parents are taken care of. When that duty falls upon them, then it's the responsibility to make sure that parents get the care that they need, the best care possible, the best care that God is able to give uh, for them at that time. So you owe it to your parents but more importantly, you owe it to God. Look what it says at the end of verse 4. For that is good and acceptable before God. This is the, the next motive for caring for our parents. It's pleasing to God. By telling families to take care of their own needy, the apostle was not trying to simply reduce the church's budget. I mean, that really wasn't the point. But it was showing true godliness. It was pleasing to the Lord. And he wanted to make sure that Christians glorify God by loving their families. And that underscores the importance of the family. You know, the church should exemplify family love to the rest of the world. Uh, and this is, this is so important that he gives a strong warning. Look down in verse number 8 of chapter 5. And we know this, but if any provide not for his own, and especially those of his own house, He hath denied the faith and is worse than a what? Infidel. If you don't take care of your own, then you basically have denied the faith. Even pagans have a sense of duty to their relatives, especially ones living under their own roof. And so therefore, a Christian that refuses to take care of their own is worse than an infidel, Paul says. You're worse than a pagan. The husband or Father must bear the ultimate responsibility to see to it that his family has whatever resources needed by whatever means God provides. That is his responsibility. Any dereliction of this duty is tantamount to denial of the Lord of Christ. And so all too often modern society shoves the elderly out of sight and put them out of mind. And that's not what God would have us do. The way Christians care for parents and grandparents ought to proclaim to the world the love of God. They ought to see it in us 
they should see it in the church. Now, unfortunately, some widows have families that will not take care of them. They may be abandoned by their families. They may be all alone. They may lack food or clothing and so on and destitute. But in that case, the church needs to help. And this is what Paul is calling upon the church to do. If no one else will help, the church should show mercy because this widow is part of the family of God. And we should take it upon ourselves to make sure that this widow is taken care of. That's what he means when he says, honor widows who are truly widows. The word honor to, honor to may is the Greek word, give respect or recognition. It uh, comes from the fifth commandment, commandment, honor your father and your mother. And when God talks about honoring, this means more than just respect. Respect, it means meeting that person's emotional and material needs. And so Paul gives a physical qualification. If a widow has family, has children and grandchildren, it's their responsibility to make sure that she's taken care of. But if she's forsaken, then the church needs to help. But also there's a spiritual qualification on this, however. Look, notice the next thing. Help a widow if she's faithful. We help a widow if she does not have independent means, but another qualification is help a widow if she's faithful. Notice in verse number 5. Now, she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. Here is a woman that has set her hope on God. She has devoted herself to godliness. She continues in prayers and supplications. And so this verse calls Christian widows to a unique ministry of prayer, I think a unique ministry of intercession, both publicly and privately. There's a book written by a woman named Susan Hunt who talks about this ministry in her book, By Design, God's Distinct Calling for Women. But let me just read you an excerpt of what she says here. She says, It seems to me that widows who have entered into a dimension of dependence on God that, prepare, that prepares them for the ministry of intercessory prayer. The widows might was recognized and commended by Jesus because she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Perhaps this widow's might, and she spells the word here, M-I-G-H-T, might, is most mighty when these women band together as helper defenders in intercessory prayer. And um, so she's calling upon those widows to have a ministry of Prayer. Older women who do not have daily responsibility of jobs uh, are, you know, Paul is saying here, a power source for intercessory prayer. That's what he's saying. I think maybe the best example of a praying widow is Anna in the Bible. You remember the story of Anna, Luke chapter 2. She is in the temple at Jerusalem. Notice what it says in verse 7 of chapter 2 of Luke. Just jot this verse down. You can read it later. She was a widow of about fourscore and four years. She was 84, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And it seems like Paul here uh, is kind of referring to that passage when he encourages widows to continue in supplications and prayers night and day. What a great ministry that is. I mean, you know, when I was in Korea, I preached in a church. I met an elderly woman who was a widow, and she really humbled me when she came up to me and she said, I want you to know I pray for you every day. She said this through a translator, of course. I pray for you every day. Really? What a shock. What a surprise that she would pray for me every day. What a blessing to know that there's this woman who prays for me every day. Did you know that godly widows like Anna prayed all over the Soviet Union during the dark days of communism. When one pastor visited the Ukraine after the fall of that evil empire, this is what he saw. I want to quote from him. He says this, How mistaken the communists were when they allowed the older women to continue worshiping together. It was they who were considered no threat to the new order. But it was they whose prayers and faithfulness over all those barren years held the church together, and raised up a generation of men and young people to serve the Lord. 
Yes, the church we attended was crowded with these older women at the very front, for they had been the stalwart defenders and maintainers of Christ's gospel. But behind them and alongside them and in the balcony and outside the windows were the fruit of their faithfulness, men, women, young people, and children. We must never underestimate the place and the power of our godly women. Isn't that a good testimony there? It was their prayers that made such a huge difference. The prayers of widows give strength to the church. And so Paul makes clear that in the next verses, that widows who are not faithful and godly have no right to expect any support from the church. Look at verse number 6. Notice what he says. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Now, Paul here is describing a widow who has not set her heart on God. Instead, she takes comfort in the things of this world, and she lives for pleasure rather than for God. She likes to pamper herself. The word translated pleasure here uh, indicates um, you know, indulgence, self-indulgence. It may even imply that she prostitutes herself for profit, one scholar said. A woman who likes to live it up like this, Paul said, she's dead while she lives. She belongs to the living dead because although she's alive physically, she is not alive to God through faith. That's what he's saying right here. And so what you see is a contrast between a godly widow who's worthy of support and help and one that is not, that is self-indulgent. You have one that is self-denial in prayer, another that is self-indulgent with all their passions. And so what the Scripture implies is that a widow who lives for pleasure has no right to expect any help whatsoever from the church. This is a reminder that mercy from the church is not an entitlement. The church has a responsibility to identify real needs and uh, and, um, make those commitments to people that have genuine needs. This means, you know, you you have to ask some questions. You know, what resources do you have? Is there anyone in your family that can help you, that can take care of you? What do you need to get by? Are you walking with the Lord? And so forth. All those things need to be checked. It's up to uh, the leadership of the church, the deacons in the church, to kind of make those judgments to see if someone has a genuine need. And when there is a genuine need, the church needs to step up and, and help out in that need. That's what Paul is saying right here. And so some people... Uh, don't need any help materially because they have families that will support him. Some people do need help, and, and they're worthy of that investment because these are widows who are living a godly life. Um, and so these are really just basically the family rules that Paul gives here at this point. So let me just go over them with you as we close tonight. What are they? Number one, respect elderly saints as your own parents. Respect younger saints as your own brothers and sisters. Respect godly widows as objects of God's special care. And when you see a need there, make sure that you're proactive to meet that need. Follow these family rules in the church. There's a wonderful story about this. Some of you know I was just over in the Philippines. I read of a missionary over there named Joanne Shetler, and after two, ga- after two decades of intensive labor, this missionary, she was a missionary to the uh, Balanego, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Balanego tribe in the Philippine Islands, and, and many turned to faith in Jesus Christ um, there in that tribe. And, and this missionary helped to translate the Bible into the language of the Balanego people there. And she writes about when they came to 1 Timothy and began to translate this into the language of the people, this passage here had a special influence on the people there. She tells what happens when she got down to this particular passage about taking care of widows. This is what she says happens. We got to the end of the book where it talks about widows in need and the church's responsibility to take over for widows who have no other source of livelihood. About that same time... uh, for San, one of those older women who lost her husband, she was a widow indeed, 
because all of her children had long been dead. She had no relatives in the Balanego tribe. In fact, she was not even part of the tribe. But in the Balanego culture, there's no mercy if there's no blood connection. She would have been left alone in her house without, uh, with or without food until she died. One of the men, she writes, who had helped me in the translation, went over and took her by the hand with her one little pot, brought her over and said, you will be like my mother and you will live with us in our home. And the missionary goes on to write, that old woman is there today, even though she's old, even though she's sickly, she's taken care of by that family. That passage that they were translating uh, transformed the view of that whole tribe, and they began to love like families are supposed to love. Once this Here's this tribe of people that received the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and learned the Word of God and began to love in the church with a family love. And that's what God calls us to. It's really, the rule is simple. Just, we're all one family in Christ. We need to have family love for one another. We need to have love and respect and make sure to take care of one another, especially those that are in need. Let's bow for prayer together tonight. And so, Father, thank you for the the Word of God again, and it's so very practical for us. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to follow these simple guidelines as we show respect and love to our brothers and sisters in the family of God. Lord, give us discernment to know real needs, to see real needs, and be quick to help as those that are in our family, Lord, that need to be shown the love and the special care of God. And Lord, may the world see that, and may this be a testimony to the world of our love. And may we heed the words of our Lord who said, the world will know that you're my disciples by the love that you show one for another. God, help us to live like family, the family of God, for your honor and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name.